So, Ed Snowden, um, a lot of people in this country are probably curious, when was the last time you had substantive discussions about coming home to the United States, and would this still be your preference? Do you still refer to it as home? <laughs> uh, the United States will always be my home, um, and I'll always be willing uh, to come back uh, on a single condition, and I've, I've been quite clear about this over the years. Uh, this is that the government uh, guarantee that I have the right, and every whistleblower has the right, to tell the jury why they did what they did. Right? We can disagree uh, about whether this was right or wrong. We can disagree about whether this is good or bad. We can disagree about whether this is legal or le illegal. That's right and proper in a democracy. But we have to agree that the jury is supposed to be the proper authority to ultimately decide was this right or wrong. And I hate to say it, but under the current laws, um, that is explicitly forbidden uh, under the Espionage Act, which, as you know, it's increasingly being used against the sources of journalism instead of foreign spies. Uh, the law makes no distinction between someone who uh, tells a secret to a journalist uh, and someone who tells a secret to a foreign government. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, there, have not, there has not been any movement, unfortunately, on that conversation since the Obama administration when uh, I told um, the, the government that uh, all they need to do is give me the right of what we call a public interest defense. Uh, this is a fair trial, an open trial, where the jury hears what is happening and they decide, was this justified or not? Um, and un unfortunately, uh, then Attorney General Eric Holder responded and said, uh, we can't promise that. We won't promise that. We will promise not to torture you. Uh, unfortunately, I'd say uh, that's not quite enough. Something you've said repeatedly is that you would expect and you would accept a certain punishment for your actions. What if that package of punishment included working for the home team? What if someone said, help us harden our elections from attack using your skills? Uh, I would volunteer uh, for that instantly. You know, they, they wouldn't even have to pay uh, me for that. Remember, uh, I volunteered to work for the CIA, for the NSA. Um, when I came forward to reveal mass surveillance, which we need to be clear, the courts have found was in fact unlawful on the part of the government, and one court said likely unconstitutional. Um, so I have uh, no objection to helping the government. Uh, I came forward not to burn the NSA down. Uh, I came forward to reform it, to help it return to the ideals that we're all supposed to share. Uh, so there will never be a question of when my government is ready um, when my government wants me to help, I will be there. How has your opinion changed about Mr. Putin since you've been in Russia? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't think uh, it really has changed because uh, the, the question might presume that I had a positive opinion at, at some point. Um, I think everyone would agree, probably including the Russian president himself, uh, that he is an authoritarian leader. Uh, I think the Russian government broadly does not have a good record on, on human rights, um, and that hasn't changed. How odd is it to you that while you've been there, consensus here has hardened that they are the actors who interfered in our last presidential election? I don't think that's especially surprising. Um, there was a story published in the uh, New York Times actually reporting on a study uh, in February of 2018, uh, and it was also done in the uh, Washington Post uh, a few months prior to that, about the record of electoral interference. Um, and they looked at the history of uh, Russia and the Soviet Union and electoral interference by intelligence agencies, uh, and they found, I think, 36 different cases uh, of electoral interference over roughly the past 50 years. But then they also looked at the United States Intelligence Services and found that we had interfered in foreign elections uh, 81 different times. Um, now, this is not to say one is better than the other. It's, it's not uh, about that. It's about budget, about, it's about capability. Um, but we do, what we do see from this is that what happened in 2016 actually was not unusual from the perspective of intelligence agencies. This is what they believe are, they are hired to do. Uh, what we have to do 
is find out how to secure our systems against the attacks that we know are inevitable. Something you've been asked before, something you have answered before, but since this is a fresh occasion, we'll, we'll ask it again. Why not stay in this country and face the music if you believed in the strength of your conviction? Uh, this is a great question, Brian, and I'm, I'm glad you asked it. Uh, when we say face the music, the question is, well, what song are they playing? Uh, I was intentionally charged, uh, as every major whistleblower in the last decades has been, um, with a very particular uh, crime. Um, this is a violation of the Espionage Act of 1917. Um, and, and this is a law uh, that is explicitly designed to prohibit a meaningful defense in court. Uh, this is applied, or this law is used uh, against people whose, the only thing that they've done, and this is by the government's own terms, uh, the only thing the government accuses people uh, defending themselves against this charge uh, have done uh, is that they have told something to a journalist that the government considers classified. That is the whole of the crime. Um, they don't consider whether it was good or bad. They don't consider whether or not it caused harm. Simply, did you tell something classified to a journalist? If you did, uh, the jury is not allowed to consider. In fact, they're explicitly forbidden from considering why you told journalists. They're explicitly forbidden from considering, did it result in a public benefit, right? Did it further the public interest? Uh, instead, they simply say, did you tell a journalist something classified? So I am not, uh, if I had stayed in the United States, and my good friend Daniel Ellsberg, by the way, has uh, told me that I was right uh, not to uh, stand and wait for an inevitable arrest, because the laws and the way they're enforced today is not the same as the 1970s when he came forward with the Pentagon Papers. I would not have uh, received a, a fair trial. Uh, there would not have been much of a trial at all. Uh, I would only have received a sentencing. And the question there is, um, what message does that send, whether you like me or not? Uh, I could be the best person in the world, I could be the worst. What message does a conviction where you spend the rest of your life in prison for telling journalists things that change the laws of the United States, uh, that have re resulted in the most substantive reforms to intelligence authorities uh, since the 1970s, uh, if the only result of doing that is a life sentence in prison. The next person who sees something criminal happening in the United States government uh, will be discouraged from coming forward, and I can't be a part of that. Where do your parents come down on what you did? In the book, we learn a lot more than we knew about them. They were both, uh, we say this in quotes, deep staters. We learn that they both had varying degrees of security <laughs> clearances in their lives. Uh, yeah, I come from a, a federal family. Uh, my father worked for the military. My mother works for the courts. Uh, my whole line, uh, going back, has uh, worked in the, in the government service. Um, so I think this was difficult for them. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I will be eternally grateful for uh, is the fact that they still stand by me today um, and believe that I did the right thing. Were they present for your wedding? You've gone and gotten married in the years since we've last spoken. <laughs> uh, there hasn't been a wedding um, yet, actually. Uh, we were married, uh, but it was just a, a paperwork exercise in a courthouse um, because uh, Lindsay and I had been living together. Uh, we had been in love with each other. We had been in a relationship for, for more than 10 years. Um, there will be a wedding someday, uh, Brian, and I hope you'll be there. What do you make of Donald Trump? There are so many things uh, that are said about the president right now, um, and so much thinking, and honestly, I, I try not to think about it. Uh, there's so much chaos, and there are so many uh, aggressive and offensive things said. Uh, <laughs> I think even his supporters would, would grant that. Um, but I think he's actually quite simple to understand. Uh, Donald Trump strikes me like nothing so much as a man who has never really known a love that he hasn't had to pay for. And so everything that he does is informed by a kind of transactionalism, I think. And what he is actually looking for uh, is simply for people to like him. 
unfortunately, that produces a lot of negative effects. Do you believe he is a threat to national security? I mean, this is the, a question of who defines national security. Um, what is national security? When we used to talk about national security, we, we thought about uh, public safety. But now national security uh, really means the security of the, the system itself, uh, the institution of government. And I think he's made it his stated goal uh, to change the way that system works. Um, I think we have seen uh, tremendous harm done to civil liberties in the United States uh, increasingly since September 11th, and I haven't seen any uh, reduction in the rate of that. We have several important jobs uh, vacant in this country, including Director of National Security, National Security Advisor. Is that a threat to our security? <laughs> I think it really says something uh, about we, where we are, uh, what this point in our history uh, looks like. When we find that there are not enough people in the country that are willing uh, to serve in the White House and, and qualified to serve in the White House, uh, who all sides of the government uh, feel comfortable working with and who they can back, uh, we are in a time that is increasingly fractured. And I think that's a product of the fact that, look, if, if you look around at the world right now, when you look at news, when you look at news coverage, when you look at every controversy that we see, um, something has changed. Uh, and that is that it has become increasingly popular for your feelings to matter more than the facts. And I think that's toxic to a democracy, because if there's one thing that we have to have, uh, to be able to have this discussion, to be able to learn to live with people that we disagree with. Uh, we can't have a conversation about what we should do. We can't have a conversation about uh, where we are going if we can't agree on where we are, if we can't agree on what is happening. Facts have to matter more than feelings. You've said your greatest fear uh, over what you did was that things would not change. Have things changed? Would you do it again today knowing what you know now? Uh, this is a significant portion of the, the final chapter uh, of my book. Um, things have changed, and I would do it again. If I changed anything, uh, I would hope that I could have come forward sooner. Uh, it took me so long just to understand what was happening, uh, and it took so long uh, to realize that nobody else uh, was going to fix this. Um, <laughs> believe me when I say um, I did not want to light a match and, and burn my life to the ground. No one does. Um, nobody really wants to be a, a whistleblower. But the results of that uh, have been staggering. I thought this was going to be a two-day story. I thought everybody was going to forget about this uh, a week after um, the journalists ran the first stories in 2013. But here we are in 2019, and we're still talking about it. In fact, uh, data security, surveillance, the Internet, uh, manipulation and influence uh, that's provided or produced, rather, by uh, corporate or governmental control of uh, this permanent record of all of our private lives that's being created every day by the devices that we have. Um, before 2013, if you said there's a system that's watching everything you do, the government is collecting records of every phone call in the United States, uh, even for those people who are not suspected of any crime. It was a conspiracy. Yes, there were some people who believed it was happening. Yes, there were academics who could say this was technically possible. Yes, there were technologists who could, could, went, uh, this is something that could be done. Um, but what we didn't have is we, the world of 2013, we suspected, some suspected that this was happening. The world after 2013, we know that it's happening. And this is the critical importance of journalism, particularly in this moment that we have today. The distance between speculation and fact is everything in a democracy, because that's what lets us, as we did post-2013, change our laws. Now, the very first program that was revealed in newspapers uh, has since been terminated. Barack Obama, who criticized me so strongly in June of 2013, by January of 2014, was proposing that this program be ended. Eventually, it was ended under the USA Freedom Act. Uh, the uh, 
NSA argued that mass surveillance was legal, bulk collection, as they, they call it. Um, they said 15 different judges authorized this. What they didn't tell us was that those 15 judges all belonged to the rubber stamp FISA court, uh, that over 33 years had been asked uh, 33,900 times by the government to approve surveillance requests, and only said no in 33 years 11 times. Now, this was a court that was never designed to interpret the Constitution, right? It was never designed to create uh, novel powers for the intelligence community. It was just designed to stamp basic routine warrants. Um, now we know what has changed. The very first open court outside of these secret rubber stamp courts that got uh, this case in front of them, uh, it was Judge Leon uh, in a federal court um, and then a court of appeals, uh, said that the NSA's mass surveillance activities were violating even the very loose standards of the Patriot Act. They broke the law. He further said these programs are likely unconstitutional. Uh, and this would not have happened uh, if we couldn't say, this is real, this is actually happening. And I, I just want to make clear, um, that's not me saying that. That's not speculation. Uh, that was the determination of the Supreme Court just a few months before I came forward. Uh, in a famous case, Amnesty versus Clapper, uh, I, I believe it was in February of 2013 or, or December of 2012, um, all the way to the Supreme Court, these surveillance authorities were being challenged. Uh, the plaintiff said the government has a mass surveillance program. It has impacted uh, this human rights organization. They have been spied on in secret by the government. The government said that may be, but if it's happening, we will neither conform confirm nor deny that it's happening. Uh, it is a state secret. And because you can't prove it, the court should be forbidden uh, from ruling on the constitutionality of this program. And sadly, the Supreme Court of the United States agreed. They said, this program could be unconstitutional, but if you cannot prove it exists, we cannot evaluate it. That's what 2013 changed. On the legal side, um, we have now had the GDPR. We have had the first European regulations uh, that are trying to um, limit the amount of data that can be collected secretly and used against populations broadly. Uh, and we have also seen the basic structure of the Internet itself change in response to this understanding that, that uh, the network path that all of our communications cross, when you request a website, when you send a text message, when you read an email, uh, for so long, those communications have been electronically naked or unencrypted. Before 2013, more than half the world's internet communications were unencrypted. Now, far more than half are measured by uh, just web traffic from one of the world's leading browsers, uh, the Google Chrome browser. Uh, some figures show it at more than 80%. Um, the entire world has changed. Uh, in the last few years. It hasn't gone far enough. The problems still exist. Uh, and in some ways, they've gotten worse. But we have made progress that would not have been possible if we didn't know what was going on. Related question. What today can the government do uh, to your phone and your laptop, the phone and laptop of any American? Um, what's the extent of the government's reach if they're determined to reach into your life? <laughs> Uh, we could talk about this question for hours, <laughs> Brian, but we don't have time, so I'll, I'll try to summarize. Um, hacking uh, has increasingly become uh, what governments consider a legitimate investigative tool. They use the same methods and techniques as criminal hackers. And what this means is they will try to remotely take over your device. Once they do this, um, by detecting a vulnerability in, in the software that your uh, device runs, such as Apple's iOS or Microsoft Windows, they can craft a special kind of attack code called an exploit. They then launch this exploit at the vulnerability on your device, which allows them to take total control of that device. Anything you can do on that device, uh, the attacker, in this case the government, can do. They can read your email. They can collect every document. They can look at your contact book. They can turn the location services on. They can see anything that is on that phone instantly and send it back home to the mothership. They can do the same with laptops. 
The other prong that we forget so frequently is that in many cases they don't need to hack our devices. They can simply ask Google for a copy of our email box because Google saves a copy of that. Everything that you ever typed into that search box, Google has a copy of. Every private message that you've sent on Facebook, every link that you've clicked, everything that you've liked, they keep a permanent record of. Uh, and all of these things are available not just to these companies, but to our governments as they are increasingly deputized as uh, sort of miniature arms of government. What about enabling your microphone camera? If you can do it, they can do it. Uh, it is trivial uh, to remotely turn on your microphone or to, to activate your camera so long as you have systems level access. If you had hacked someone's device remotely, anything they can do, you can do. Uh, they can look up your nose, right? They can record what's in the room. The screen may be off as it's sitting on your desk, uh, but the device is talking all of the time. The question we have to ask is who is it talking to? Even if your phone is not hacked, right now, you look at it, it's just sitting there on the charger. Uh, it is talking tens or hundreds or thousands of times a minute to any number of different companies uh, who have apps installed on your phone. Uh, it looks like it's off, it looks like it's just sitting there, but it is constantly chattering. And unfortunately, like pollution, uh, we have not created the tools that are necessary for ordinary people to be able to see this activity. And it is the invisibility of it that makes it so popular and common uh, and attractive for these companies. Because if you do not realize they're collecting this data from you, this very private and personal data, um, there's no way you're going to object to it. What about its ability to track its owner? And talk to me specifically about the case of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, so in the case of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, this is a Washington Post reporter uh, and a primary critic of the Saudi regime. Um, he was lured um, into the Saudi Arabian consulate uh, in Istanbul, in, in Turkey. Uh, and while his fiance waited outside uh, for him to get the paperwork he needed in order to marry her, he was murdered by the Saudi government, allegedly on the orders of the crown prince. Um, now, we have to ask ourselves, how did the Saudi government decide that he was worth killing? How did they decide when and how they would kill him? How did they know this opportunity was going to arise? How did they know what his plans and intentions were that they needed uh, to stop from their perspective? We don't have evidence that his phone personally was hacked, unfortunately, because we do not have his phone. Um, but we do have the phones of his friends who were living in exile in Canada. And we do know, thanks to the research of a group called the Citizen Lab, uh, affiliated with a university in Canada, that their phones were hacked, which means their conversations with Jamal Khashoggi were intercepted. And this allowed the Saudi regime to know that he was intending to create an electronic protest movement. Um, they didn't need to know uh, from uh, his friend's phone or even from his phone uh, that he was traveling to the consulate because he had to make an appointment. But it did tell them uh, his private intentions, his hopes and dreams for a different government for their country. And perhaps, although we do not know for sure, on that basis, they decided to murder him. Once your phone is hacked, um, what is in their hands is not simply your device, it is your future. It's important also to remember, uh, how did the government of Saudi Arabia manage to hack these people's phones, uh, which are modern phones? Well, they didn't have this capability uh, in their government. They didn't have this level of uh, intelligence capability available to them directly. So they purchased it from a digital arms broker, a company called the NSO Group, an Israeli company. Um, and this company, the only thing they do is manufacture uh, digital weapons, uh, kind of hacking tools that can be used against the critical infrastructure that all of us rely on, the phones in our pockets. Uh, they primarily target devices such as the Apple iPhone. 
And they sell this capability to break into phones of people around the world for millions and millions of dollars to some of the worst governments on Earth. And the only meaningful oversight that they have, unfortunately, because the export uh, control laws for these kind of digital weapons are extremely weak in Israel, uh, is their own internal ethics board that says, oh, it was fine. Uh, we didn't break any rules. That has to change. What about the public attitude um, uh, held by millions of everyday Americans? Um, all I've got uh, on a computer is pictures of my family, uh, CCTV cameras that are prevalent in uh, a ton of American cities and overseas capitals. Uh, those cameras are your friend if you're innocent and have nothing to hide. Well, I'd say that's very much uh, what the average Chinese citizen uh, believed, or perhaps even still to this day believes. But we see how these same technologies are, are being applied to create what they call the social credit system. Um, if any of these family photos, if any of your activities online, if your purchases, if your associations, if your friends are in any way different from what the government or the powers that be of the moment uh, would like them to be, uh, you're no longer able to purchase train tickets. You're no longer able to board an airplane. You may not be able to get a passport. You may not be eligible for a job. You might not be able to work for the government. Uh, all of these things are increasingly being created and programmed and decided by algorithms. And those algorithms are fueled by precisely the innocent data that our devices are creating all of the time, constantly, invisibly, quietly, right now. Um, our devices are uh, casting all of these records uh, that we do not see being created uh, that in aggregate seem very innocent. You were at Starbucks at this time. Uh, you went to the hospital afterwards. You spent a long time at the hospital. After you left the hospital, you made a phone call. You made a phone call to your mother. You talked to her until the middle of the night. The hospital was an oncology clinic. Um, even if you can't see the content of these communications, the activity records, what the government calls metadata, which they argue they do not need a warrant to collect, um, tells the whole story. And these activity records are being created and shared and collected and intercepted constantly by companies and governments. Uh, and ultimately, it means uh, as they sell these, as they trade these, as they make their businesses on the backs of these records, what they are selling uh, is not information. What they are selling is us. They're selling our future. They're selling our past. They are selling our history, our identity. And ultimately, they are stealing our power and making our stories work for them. What devices do you use in your life now? And have you um, accepted the notion that you are watched rather constantly? <laughs> well, probably every intelligence in the world is definitely uh, targeting me and trying to learn anything they can, uh, just as they did with Jamal Khashoggi, uh, in regards to what are my plans and intentions. Um, I try not to make that easy for them. Uh, if I get a smartphone and I need to use a phone, uh, I actually open it up before I use it. I, I perform a kind of surgery on it to physically desolder uh, or, or sort of melt uh, the metal connections that hold the microphone on the phone. And I physically take this off. I remove the camera for the phone and then I close it back up. I seal it up. And then if I need to make a phone call, I will attach an external microphone on it. And this is just so... Um, if the phone is sitting there and I'm not making a call, it cannot hear me. Now, this is extreme. Most people do not need this. But for me, it's about being able to trust our technology. My phone could still be hacked. My laptop could still be hacked. And just as I told you before, the same principles apply to me. If it is hacked, they can do anything to the device that I can do. Uh, so my trust in technology is limited. But just because that's how it is today doesn't mean that's how it has to be. Uh, and a large majority of my work with the Freedom of the Press Foundation, where I serve as president of the board, 
uh, is dedicated to trying to make technology more secure, to try to create programs and, and protocols by which we can make uh, the communications of sources and journalists uh, more confidential. Because if we lose the confidentiality between sources and journalists, we lose access to those essential facts that let us understand what's happening in the world. And unfortunately, under this White House, just like under the prior White House, uh, we see the sources of very important stories that have advanced the public interest uh, facing retaliation um, from a very angry government. I believe it's in the first half of the book, and I'm paraphrasing, you come out and just say, the computer guy knows everything, or at least he should. Um, what part computer guy are you, were you, and what part trained spy? <laughs> well, for the vast majority of my career, um, I was what was called uh, a systems engineer or a systems administrator. Uh, an administrator sort of maintains and expands a system um, that they have inherited, uh, and a systems engineer uh, sort of develops new projects, uh, new capabilities for, for these systems roles. Uh, what this means in short uh, was that all of the systems at the NSA and the CIA uh, that I was put in charge of, I had total access to. Um, and this is just uh, what happens with a systems administrator. When you think about a computer system, who gives someone else access? Well, someone has to be the original authority that has access to everything. Um, that was me. And so I would say the uh, computer guy knows everything. Um, that's not a boast. That's simply the way these systems are designed. That, that's the way they're structured. Um, and this is very much uh, a vulnerability because it means that you have to trust. Uh, this this uh, administrator will work to the good of the users. Um, but what happens when the people using that network, the people constructing that network, are going against uh, the benefit of the broader society? And this put me in a very interesting um, kind of conflicted position. Uh, I could do what the NSA wanted me to do, or I could do what the Constitution of the United States, the, the public of the United States, uh, needed me to do, um, which was report that my agency had broken the law. Do you regard yourself as a journalist these days? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I have tremendous respect for journalists, but I try to keep uh, a distance, particularly in this moment where so much of journalism is coming under attack, uh, because the government has a tremendous incentive uh, to discredit me, to, to make people distrust me. Um, and so if I hold myself out, if I start reporting stories, if I start talking to sources, uh, if I try to start um, advancing uh, what the public knows on, on a personal level, uh, my reputation could, could sort of poison the well. Uh, instead, I keep a distinction. What I do is I try to aid the work of journalism, uh, but I am not myself a journalist. Your book is highly personal. Um, tell us about the price your then girlfriend, now wife, paid for your actions and how you feel she was misportrayed in the eyes of the world when we got that first kind of thumbnail sketch of who she was. So in the wake of um, the revelations of mass surveillance in 2013, uh, this was suddenly uh, the world's biggest story. In every country, they were talking about the same thing. And unfortunately, that meant that everyone who was connected to me in, in some way, they were also talking about because they were trying to uh, say who I was, uh, where I came from. Um, and this unfortunately meant that uh, Lindsay, uh, my lifelong partner, um, was intensely investigated, both by the FBI in the United States. Uh, she didn't know what I was doing. I could not tell her what I was doing. Um, because if I had, uh, they would have said she was an accessory to the crime. Um, they would have said uh, she was part of a criminal conspiracy, so long as she didn't immediately pick up the phone and say, help, help, someone's talking to a journalist. Um, and so this meant that I couldn't tell her. She learned about what was going to happen um, the same way everybody else did, or rather what is happening, uh, the same way everybody else did. She saw me on TV, which probably makes me the worst boyfriend in the history of the United States. But she stuck by me, uh, and we are reunited and, and together today. Um, and I will never be able to repay her uh, for the faith that she's shown me. 
But the media uh, had a tremendous amount of salacious reporting. Um, when they realized that she taught pole, pole fitness uh, classes, which are po quite popular for women these days, uh, they called her a stripper, even though she's never been one. Um, even though she's a poet, uh, even though she's a photographer, uh, they sexualized her. They focused on her body. They focused on her image um, because that's what got attention. Uh, she's a much more complex and deep figure than the media ever gave her credit for. Uh, she is more brave um, than anyone can possibly understand. Uh, and she's more political and intelligent um, than any of these reporters uh, at the time could appreciate. Uh, her politics, in fact, influenced mine. Uh, <laughs> and I'd like to think I learned as much from her, or perhaps even more, uh, than she ever learned from me. You paint a portrait of uh, what some of us knew, and that was that you were a thoroughly American kid in your upbringing. Um, you wake up every day in Russia. You go to sleep every night in Russia. Um, are you actively seeking to get out? Are you, as has been reported, looking for asylum elsewhere? Well, this is not an actively seeking. This is not a new thing. Um, and this is important history, uh, especially for those people who don't like me, um, for those people who doubt me, who have heard terrible things about me. It was never my intention to end up in Russia. Uh, I was going to Latin America, and my final destination was hopefully going to be Ecuador. When the United States government heard um, that I had left Hong Kong, where I met the journalists, uh, they canceled my passport. They gave press conferences about it, which meant I wasn't allowed to board my ongoing flight, which was going to take me uh, to Latin America. Rather than applying for Russian asylum, Rather than saying, I'll play ball with any Russian intelligence service, just please protect me. I said, no, I will not cooperate with the Russian government or any government. Instead, what I did, as I was trapped for 40 days in an airport, I don't know what your longest layover is, but uh, 40 days was a, was a tough stint. I applied for asylum in 27 different countries around the world. Traditional U.S. allies, places like France and Germany, places like Norway, uh, that I felt the U.S. government um, and the American public could be comfortable that was fine for a whistleblower to be in. And yet every time uh, one of these governments got close to opening their doors, uh, the phone would ring and they're in their foreign ministries. And on the other end of the line would be a very senior American official. Uh, it was one of two people, then Secretary of State John Kerry uh, or then Vice President Joe Biden. Um, and they would say, look, we don't care what the law is. We don't care if you can do this or not. We understand that protecting whistleblowers and granting asylum is a matter of human rights. And you could do this if you want to. But if you protect this man, if you let this guy out of Russia, there will be consequences. We're not going to say what they're, uh, they're going to be, uh, but there will be a response. I continue to this day uh, to say, look, um, if the United States government, if these countries uh, are willing to open the door, that is not a hostile act. That is the act of, the friend, of a friend. If anything, if the United States government is so concerned about Russia, right, shouldn't they be happy for me to leave? And yet we see they're trying so hard to prevent me from leaving. I would ask you, why is that? I'm guessing Joe Biden is not your candidate for 2020. <laughs> Actually, I don't take a position on the 2020 race. Um, look, it's a difficult position uh, being in the executive branch. It's a difficult position uh, being in power, and you have to make unpopular decisions. Um, I would like to think, having seen now in 2019, that all of the allegations against me did not come true. Uh, national security was not harmed as a result of these disclosures. Uh, but they did win the Pulitzer Prize for public uh, service journalism. Um, the laws were changed as a result. The courts said these programs were unconstitutional. Uh, we live in a safer and more secure world because the Internet is safer and more secure as a result of understanding these common vulnerabilities, which not just U.S. intelligence agencies were exploiting, but our adversaries were exploiting. When we close these holes, uh, we do not become more vulnerable. We become more secure. In 2013, it's fair to say uh, some of these officials, some of these candidates could go, 
The intelligence services are saying this guy's dangerous. They're saying this is a risk. They're saying this shouldn't have happened. In 2019, we can see that no evidence has ever been presented uh, that the public understanding mass surveillance is real uh, has caused any kind of harm whatsoever. No one has died. No terrorist attacks have uh, succeeded because we knew about this stuff. These programs work regardless of whether or not you know about them. Um, but we have seen the public benefits uh, substantiated year after year after year. Uh, and so I'd like to think these people would reevaluate their position. You know, there are government officials who would push back very strong on your assertion that national security was not harmed. You, you chose not to stop with your revelations at what was being done to Americans, and you got into America and its allies and perceived enemies. When we're looking at uh, the reports that were published in 2013, it's important to understand I never published a single story. Uh, the number of documents uh, that I revealed uh, is zero. What I did was I collected an archive of material showing criminality or unethical or unconstitutional behavior on the part of the United States uh, government. I provided this archive to journalists uh, who were required as a condition of access to this material um, not to publish any story because it's interesting. They could publish no story simply because it's newsworthy. They were only allowed, uh, as so far as the agreement went, to publish stories that they were willing to stand up and say were in the public interest to know. Uh, and this is not some crazy fly-by-night organization. These are newspapers uh, like The Washington Post, like The New York Times, like The Guardian. Um, and in every case, this process was followed. Now, as an extraordinary check on top of this, uh, in case I went too far, in case I collected a, a document that was too hot, uh, or I misunderstood things, or the, jur the journalists misunderstood things, the journalists uh, were further required to go to the government in advance of publication, and they were required to do this at my request and warn the government, this is the story that we're going to run. This is what it's about. This is what we're going to say. So the government could argue against it to create an adversarial check on what the journalists and I were trying to do, to reconstruct the system of checks and balances in the United States uh, that had itself failed in the government. And all, because that process was followed so scrupulously, that's why I am so confident that no harm happened, no harm occurred. Now, if there are those in the government that say harm took place, if there are those in the government who say people have died, I ask you this, why haven't they proved it? You know better than anyone, Brian, uh, that these government officials are more than happy to pick up a phone and make a leak to the New York Times every day of the week. Uh, if they had some evidence that somebody was hurt, if they had evidence that a terrorist attack got through because of this journalism, it would be on the front page of every newspaper in the world. And despite six years of history, that's never happened. Describe your life today. What is every day like? How are you supporting yourself? And, uh, and as, as a simple equation, if the Russians have reached so effectively into our lives and our electoral systems, they must be all over your life. <laughs> so that was several different questions. Um, but yeah, I'm sure the Russian government is trying to spy on me. I'm sure the United States government is trying to spy on me. Everyone's trying to spy on me. Um, the thing is, I don't cooperate with them. Um, my allegiance is to my country. My allegiance is to my constitution. Um, now, in my terms of my daily life, uh, it, it's actually pretty ordinary, uh, which is to say it's not so interesting. I've always been something of an indoor cat, right? I'm, I'm not going to nightclubs and, and partying. Uh, my life since I was a child has always been mediated by a screen. Um, that's by choice. So not much actually changes in my day to day, whether I'm living in New York or Berlin or Moscow. Um, in terms of my work, which a lot of people are curious about, uh, this, I think, is a polite way of uh, people asking, do you work for the Russian government? Do you accept money from the Russian government? You know, are you living in Russian government housing? Are you in a bunker? Are there guards? And of course, the answer to all of these is, is no. No, I'm not. Uh, what I do for a living um, is speak professionally, and, and now I'm actually an author. Uh, I have a speaker's bureau. It's called the American Program Bureau, 
Uh, and you can call them and you can book a, a public event. I, I speak at universities, I speak at uh, corporate events, I speak at cybersecurity conferences to talk to people about what is happening on the internet. What is the future of surveillance and how can we protect ourselves? I'm very fortunate to have had uh, that opportunity and it's meant that I've had a, a quite comfortable life in, in quite a difficult position. Um, the former White House aide H.R. Haldeman left us with an expression uh, for the ages and when he said uh, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Um, for Americans who <laughs> feel that that uh, this is just a, a behemoth that they could there's no way they could have any control over it for Americans who long ago decided we're just going to have to live with this surveillance. How could it possibly be receded or rescinded or stopped? We can stop a program. Um, we can thwart an attack. Uh, we can make a device more secure. Uh, but as you imply, um, the system is still there. Uh, the institutions and agencies and companies that produced these attacks, uh, that are creating new methods of spying every day, uh, will still be there. The fundamental change, not just in the United States, but around the world that has to happen, is we have to stop thinking about the limitations um, on how data is used as data protection regulations. Uh, right now, when we talk about what Google and Facebook are doing, right now, when we talk about what the NSA is doing, right now, when we talk about uh, what rival governments are doing, what the Russians are doing, what the Chinese are doing, what the North Koreans and the Iranians are doing, um, we're constantly thinking about, all right, this data has been collected and these companies have it. How do we regulate their use? Regulating the use is a mistake. We should do that, but that's the wrong focus. It is the collection of data that is the problem. When you start trying to regulate uh, use, you're going, the collection has already happened. The collection was already legal. Uh, one of the fundamental flaws in US privacy uh, legislation is the fact that we are one of the only advanced democracies in the world that does not have any basic privacy law whatsoever. We have the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, uh, which is the reason that I came forward. But that restricts what the federal government can do. That restricts what the state governments can do. It doesn't restrict what companies can do. And as you know, as everybody knows, these companies are playing a bigger and bigger part uh, in the world today. We have to say all of these records that they're creating about all of us, all this control that they're developing uh, from these surveillance programs, whether they're saying they're doing it for targeting advertisements or whether they're doing it for targeting killings, um, these records belong to the people that they are about, not to the companies. Uh, and this is a fundamental change that we have never discussed in a meaningful way, uh, broadly and publicly, but we have to because all of these governments uh, have said, you know, uh, the, the mass surveillance system, why do we have it? Why is it useful? They say because of terrorism. They say it's saving lives. They say it's preventing attacks. But no less than Barack Obama, in response to the 2013 revelations, uh, created two independent commissions to investigate exactly the answer to that question. Were these programs effective in stopping terrorist attacks? Uh, did these revelations cause harm to national security? Uh, it was called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board uh, and the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technologies. Uh, and despite having uh, an enormous budget, despite having complete access to classified information, despite the fact that they interviewed the heads of the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, uh, you know, the full alphabet soup, um, they found in the government's own words, uh, the kind of mass surveillance uh, that's represented by uh, this bulk collection program where the NSA was secretly collecting the phone records of every American and everybody else around the world every day under an authority provided by a secret court order that nobody even knew existed, um, that program had never made, their own words, a concrete difference in a single counterterrorism investigation. Think about that. More than 10 years of operation in secret never made a single concrete difference. These programs, mass surveillance, is not about public safety. It is not about terrorism. It is about power. 
It is about economic espionage, it is about diplomatic manipulation, and it is about social influence. It is about understanding the actions of everyone in the world as carefully as they can, no matter who they are, no matter how innocent their life. Final question has to do with the Fourth Amendment. We have it today because Mr. Adams and others wanted to keep the British out of their homes and their horse carriages. What would Mr. Adams and the founders make of the reach of the government, in your view, into our lives, given its humble beginnings? I think if any of the founders of this country looked around today, they would be shocked by the kind of rhetoric they hear, and they would be shocked by the kind of activities of government they see. If you read the Bill of Rights, uh, something that struck me when I was writing about it in, in this book, um, was that fully half of the first 10 amendments are explicitly making the work of government harder. They're making life for law enforcement officials harder. And all of the Founding Fathers thought that was a good idea because they recognized the more efficient a government is, the more dangerous it is. We want a government always that is not too efficient. We want a government always that is just efficient enough because government holds extraordinary power in our lives. We want government always to be using their powers in a way that is only necessary and proportionate to the threat presented by whoever it is that they're investigating. When the government is getting by by the skin of their teeth, the people are free, right? The government should be afraid of the people. People shouldn't be afraid of the government. One of the ironies uh, about the Founding Fathers for uh, those who are skeptical of me, which is fair. Again, I don't want you to trust me. I want you to doubt me. I want you to question me. But I want you to look at the facts. I want you to look beyond how you feel in the moment, how we all feel in the moment, um, and see what these stories said in 2013. See that the courts of the United States, where I'm being charged as a criminal, said that the government itself was engaged in criminal activity. Uh, look at these things and then remember the people who founded this country were called traitors. The signing, the writing of the Declaration of Independence was an outrageous act of treason. It was criminal, but it was also right. The question of whether or not I broke the law is less difficult and less interesting than whether you think what I did was right or wrong. What is legal is not always the same as what is moral. Final prediction, then we'll let you go uh, nightclubbing, um, and that is, uh, do you predict, <laughs> do you predict you will at some point live out your life and die in the United States? Uh, I think I will return. Um, when we look at the kind of things that were being said about me in 2013, uh, the kind of hostility I faced, the kind of accusations I faced from the most senior officials in government. And we look at the world today. Yes, there are many still who don't like me, but far, far fewer, because we have seen that all the harms that they alleged over the course of these years never came to pass. They were never substantiated because they don't exist. But the benefits are becoming more clear with each passing year. The question that I think people have to answer. Whether you like me as a person or not, right? Um, whether you agree with how I did what I did, whether you agree with the work of the journalists who decided what the public should know in order to cast their votes. Today you know the government broke the law. Today you know the United States government had broken, the, violated the Constitution and the rights of people in this country and around the world. Would you rather not know? Thank you. Ed Snowden, thank you very much. Good luck with the book. It's my pleasure, Brian. Thank you for having me. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.